Welcome to Flock Talk, Flock Talk, the podcast where we feature your favorite authors and narrators. Hosted by Craig Hart and Sarah Hannon. Visit us today at pinkflamingoproductions.com. Pink Flamingo Productions. And now, Flock Talk. Hello there, all you happy flockers out there. Welcome to Flock Talk. My name is Craig Hart, and I'm here with my world-famous co-host, Sarah Hannon. How are things going over your way, Sarah? Well, that's flattering. Um, it may be neighborhood famous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I tell you, though, I went to bed a human, and I woke up a little horse. That's my it's... wife's favorite birthday card, versus I would sing you a little birthday song, and you open up and says, but I'm a little horse, and then there's a picture of a little miniature horse. My favorite birthday card I got from my mother-in-law, and on the outside is a piece of, it's a, it's a cake. And it says, you want a piece of me? And then you open it up, and it says, looks like somebody's going to get cut. <laughs> and it's, my, it's my favorite. <laughs> That's actually a lot cleaner than I thought your favorite birthday card would be. But yeah, we'll have words later. Do you have a, you? Oh, you have an alternate. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I was almost ran late to the podcast today. I had to take the car in for an oil change and tire rotation and took forever. And I finally went to ask the attendant, like, what's going on? Why is it taking so long? He's like, are you in a hurry or something? And I said, yeah, I have to get back to a podcast to record with Sarah Hannon. And as soon as they heard your name, they were like, well, we're on it. We're going to get it done. And they had it done just like, like five minutes. It was amazing. Right. So, yep. And I'm totally not making any of that up. <laughs> anyway, let's get into today's interview. You want to kick off with by intro- our introducing our guest? I would love to do that. Uh, today, we welcome Chris Patchell. She is the award-winning USA Today bestselling author of nine novels. Her novels have been praised by Kevin O'Brien and Robert Dugoni. And her rich, complex plot lines and well-drawn characters will keep you turning pages well into the night. A former tech worker turned author, Chris Patchell penned suspense novels set in the Pacific Northwest. Welcome, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Craig. Craig, it's nice to finally meet you sort of in person. I know. I was, <laughs> was going to say, we've known each other for, or known of each other at least for a while, going back to the Kindle Scout days. Now, your winning book was, I think, In the Dark. In Am the I Dark. Am remembering that right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Well, you've come a long way since then, for sure, writing more and more books, each one better than the last. You know. Um, speaking of which, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your latest endeavor, the Lacey James series. For example, why did you choose a small town setting? Uh, you know, I grew up in small town Canada, right? So all of those kind of small town interactions where everybody knows everybody um, is something that, you know, as I get older, I maybe kind of miss a little bit. And so I kind of hearken back to my roots. Um, so I love the idea of uh, being a police officer. Lacey is a police officer in her hometown. And I love the idea that as she's solving these crimes, she's dealing with all of these people uh, that she's known most most of her life and who have known her. And so that gives you like interesting insight into people's characters and be able to advance your investigation. But it also like comes up with some really fun and interesting quirky interactions and barriers like, you know, the ex-boyfriend who's like always trying to pick her up and she's like, oh my God, you were such a loser. How did I ever, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> there's something really fun about the flavor of a small town. And so as the series progresses, I get deeper into some of those characters. And I'm thinking like, hey, how can I bring this one back for a little bit? And what kind of plot kind of thing could they serve? But then also, you know, those touch points that I think people love about small towns. Especially in in a thriller setting, because there's something about taking something that is inherently innocent and making it scary. Small towns, children, clowns, balloons. I'm getting into Stephen King territory (laughs) now, but you know what I'm saying? There's like, we turn something a stereotype on its head, sometimes it has more impact. So I think, you know, you're doing that that really well. Yeah, I love that. I also love, um, you know, the idea that we're just ordinary people. Like some books come from the uh, position of you have like this person who has a photographic memory and they've got like six uh, PhDs and they solve these crimes. I love the idea that these crimes are solved and perpetuated by everyday people whose lives have, you know, gone wrong or pushed them over the edge in certain ways, because I think that's something that we can all relate to. Everybody's got various pressures in their life. Like before we were talking about how in the Zoom world, 
<laughs> Everybody's trying to juggle their job and their kids and their uh, pets and their other obligations. And it's it's not an easy thing to do. And the more complicated these pressures come, the more, uh, the more interesting some of the ways people cope with them also become. I'm going to venture off script for just a second because I have a question that I want to <gasps> ask you as a mystery writer. Do you write the crime first, the solution first, or do you do they have to come at the same time? Like how do you how do you formulate that in your process? Uh, I usually know both, right? So um, I think probably one of the funniest stories I have about this is when I wrote a book called Dark Harvest, and it was right after I finished uh, In the Dark. And so it kind of follows in that series. And, uh, you know, my agent at the time had said, hey, I think you should write a follow-up to that book. And I was like, oh, I didn't really have any ideas. I thought it was done. And so I started to think about, all right, what kind of crime would I write about? And then I started to think about, oh, gosh, what was her name? Lacey Peterson, who disappeared when she was pregnant, you know, around Christmas time. And I got to think, like, that's the most horrible thing that could happen. And so I'm like, okay, well, who would who would actually kidnap a pregnant woman, right? What were some of the reasons why you would do that? And so over the next couple of days, I just started to think about it and let those ideas kind of swirl around in my mind. And so a few days later, my husband and I are getting ready to go out for dinner. And he says, oh, hey, Hey, have you been working on something new? And I'm like, yeah, I have this idea. And so I tell him the idea and I don't want to spoil it for you because it gets pretty deep, deep dark and twisty. Mm -hmm. uh, but I tell him the idea is like, holy crap. He's like, how long have you been working on that? And I'm like, ah, oh, three days, right? But <laughs> that's kind of my process is I like to, you know, kind of get the idea of, you know, what's the inciting event or the situation or the person, right, that the crime involves. And then I kind of uh, do a hundred thousand what ifs in my head until I kind of have figured out what actually happened and who did it and why did they do it before I even sit down and start to write it. Does that ever change during the process? Like you ever get to a point Usually, where you're like, oh, I have to take a hard left here. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it does. Uh, but more likely what happens is the end point doesn't change so much, but the way that I get to the end point changes, right? So uh, the exception to that was my very first book, um, Deadly Lies. And uh, my first draft of that one had a big shocker of an ending. And then when I realized that uh, I got to the end and went, oh, you know, there's more to this story. And so if I'm going to write a series on this, I can't end it this way, right? <laughs> so then I had to like go back and really uh, and really change the B story and build out the B story so that I could, I could write the ending a little bit differently that still uh, achieved the end result that I was going for, but did it in a very different way. And so uh, it's still, you know, out of the 700 some reviews on that book, I'm pretty sure 90% of them still go, oh my God, that ending. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, dude, you should have seen the original. <laughs> was it tough to cut the original ending? Yeah, you know, uh, Dark Harvest 2, I had a really fun kind of uh, metaphorical ending for uh, the bad guy in that book. And uh, I figured out that I know I had to change it. So I do keep it as a cut scene. And there was um, somebody who signed up to my newsletter just a little while ago and said, oh, I'm such a big fan of the Holt Foundation series. I'm like, well, hey, let me send you a couple of cut scenes, right? And so he got back to me later and went, oh, that ending. I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> Oh yes, <laughs> killing your darlings as a writer is one of the most difficult. Indeed. Even if, if even it's for the best in the end, and it you yep. know, most often is, but it's it can be tough to do for sure. But to get back to the your Lacey James series, what what do you think makes that series special? It's clearly uh, you know hitting a chord with readers. What do you, why do you think that is? I think that you know Lacey struggles with something that a lot of women struggle with, and men too, right? But I think about all of the years I worked in tech, and it was super busy, really, um, really intense jobs. And while I was doing that, I had the house to care for, right? I had young kids, all that kind of thing. And all of those pressures of being a working mom and trying to keep it all together really resonated with me and really resonate with my care uh, with my readers, right? So they can see a little bit of themselves. In and, and Lacey. The other thing about Lacey is that she has a husband who is uh, in the military. And so when you begin with Find Her, starting with Find Her, he is deployed to 
Fort Hood in Texas. And she's living with her kids in Oregon, right? So she moved back home where she had more support because he wasn't around and she didn't have the same kind of network in Texas. And so that uh, uh, that relationship where they're separated has caused a lot of tension in her life. And I think that there are a lot of um, readers who have members of the family and the military. And they resonate with that storyline too, right? Um, when I was writing it and trying to figure out the internal conflict, I was talking with a friend of mine who is a military wife. And so we talked a little bit about what that was like for her. And that helped me formulate kind of the world in which Lacey lives, right? And how she's trying to keep everything together and how it's really hard when you're physically and emotionally separated from the person that you love and the person that's supposed to be there and be your partner especially when you're in law enforcement and you can be called out in the middle of the night like that, who comes and watches your kiddos, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, Lacey's lucky enough to have a friend, uh, I call her a friend, best friend cousin uh, named Amber, who is kind of like her support system. And so when Lacey needs to go do, right, Amber's there helping keep the home fires burning. So um, I, I like that part of the story because I think it's, as we were talking about earlier, something that's relatable to folks. And I think that's why they resonate with this series is because they can relate to these characters. Like these characters, even as you go deeper into the series, there are new characters that, you know, face the same kind of struggles that we as, uh, we as people do, you know, with aging parents and all of that stuff. In your opinion... What are the pros and cons of writing a standalone versus um, a series? Ooh, that is a great question because I ponder that like every book I write. I'm <laughs> like, hey, should it be a standalone? Should it be a series? I don't know. Uh, if you look at if you look at readership, people when people fall in love with characters, right? They want to continue reading about those characters, and so I think that. Um, one of the things uh, that compelled me to make the Lacey story uh, a series was that, you know, kind of ability to uh, grow with your readers and uh, develop these characters and these stories um, that people are loving. Now, the challenge of writing a series is keeping it fresh, right? And not getting too formulaic. Like once you get into soap opera territory where you have like amnesia and, you know, you're marrying your cousin right, that you didn't know about, <laughs> then you got to think, oh, wait, wait, maybe I've, you know, to use a, a happy days reference, maybe I've jumped the shark because right. <laughs> my ideas are no longer fresh. Uh, so the pro is, you know, having people fall in love with your characters and reading through the books because they want to see what happens to those characters. And certainly that's the feedback that I've gotten on the Lacey series. The challenge is, uh, uh, the, or the draw of a standalone is writing something new, right? So writing something new with new characters, new setting, that kind of thing, is kind of this siren call out in, in the wild going, oh, but don't you really want to write something that's set in Portland? Yes, I really want to write something set in Portland. <laughs> Don't you want to write a ghost story? I would love to write a ghost story, right? So it's always that opportunity cost between the thing that you're writing and the thing that you think you want to be writing, <laughs> whether you actually want to be writing that other thing or not. It's right. like seeing the good looking guy across the bar going, hey, right? yeah. it's like, no, I'm married, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, and sometimes it comes down to a decision too between craft and, and marketing. You know, sometimes just totally. Um, so uh, it, I've always found it easier to market a series. That's true. And, yet and, I, I and when you said marketing, who, I'm like, yeah. that's a four letter word. Can you say that on the air now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I did. This is flock talk. We can say whatever we want. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Marketing's tough. And you're right. Um, marketing a series is easier. I guess you touched on this a little bit, but are there any particular things that you do to keep things fresh when writing a series. I, for example, I heard a um, an interview with Susan Mallory, who's written approximately 1.5 billion books, and <laughs> she was saying well, her one of her deepest fears is repeating, say, a character name. And she's actually did that oh. first and last. Oh, yes. um, so she has an assistant. And one of the assistant's jobs is to keep all this stuff straight for her. But and I think it, once you get to that point, that would be tough. Are there any strategies you have? Like, do you keep a series Bible or a spreadsheet? Yeah, I used to be able to like keep it all in my head, right? What I did in the tech world is, you know, I manage complex projects. And so I'm really good at dependencies and, you know, oh, remember when you did this thing over here and you changed that, you need to go back and do it in these three places. But character names are tricky, right? So I think I was reading the very last version of In the Dark. I'm lying on my couch, right, with it, ready to push like the button to uh, send it over to Kindle Scout to publish. And I realized that I have two very minor characters that are named the same. And I'm like, oh, you 
got to be kidding me, right? It's gone through like how many copy edits, right? And this still. So what I've started doing is I, I do, I keep like a thorough list of character names for every book and I can go back and double check. And, uh, and I keep like, um, because sometimes you just need I don't want to say a throwaway character. Like we all don't love our characters completely, but I do have like just a list of names. And when I've used one, I now mark it off the list so I don't use it again. But um, yeah, character Bible is something that I think as you write more series and those series become complex and you need to remember how this character met that character, you know, those things are, you know, you need to start tracking that stuff early because if you get midway through a series and now suddenly like I, I have this issue with um, hide her, which is the fourth Lacey James Brooke. I'm like, did I ever say what Amber's husband's name is? <laughs> so now I have to go look and see. Did I name Amber's husband? The one the one person I've never named in that book is just the chief of police, right? And he's always just the chief. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's tough to keep track of. And it's something that you don't want to mess up. You don't want to mess up that somebody, you know, had something happen in their past and then it happens a different way later in the series. Your readers will catch that on you. Oh, they will catch it. The very first reader will, <laughs> will yeah. catch that. Yes. Well, yeah. And uh, because a lot of my scenes, right, go uh, from one point of view character to the next, right? Timing is always really important. And so I have to like keep it in my head. We started off uh, the scene in somebody else's point of view and it was morning, right? And then I flashed to another character's point of view, which, you know, uh, chronologically happens a couple hours later, but suddenly it's nighttime. And it's like, no, that can't quite work, <laughs> right? I got to make sure that when I do uh, some of the editorial reads, I really keep a close eye on timeline. It's like, how many days was that? Yeah, okay. This is probably the single biggest reason that I don't think I could ever be an author. I had a hard enough, I have three children. I had a hard enough time naming them. <laughs> 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 my my twins were born three days later. We finally agreed on names. Like, and well, and I spent almost 20 years in early childhood education. And so like my husband would suggest a name and I'd be like, he was a biter. Oh. And, you know, <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> and so I think, yeah, I think naming characters would be like the hardest for, for me. And like, if I knew somebody, like, would they read into it that I used their name as, I don't know, <sighs> hot stud number three? Like, oh, you know, I, I should the, call her. <laughs> Clearly she's unhappy in her marriage. She named a character after me. <laughs> <laughs> the things that people read into what you write. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I, I agree. Like naming characters is tough and coming up with the right name. I do have a friend who seems to have a genius for this. And so every once in a while I'll text her and go, hey, dude, I need a character, right? And a character name for like blah. And and she'll say, what's he like, right? Or what's she like? And I'm like, do, 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 do send. And then like 15 minutes go by and then boop, I get this test me text message. And it's like, you should name her Lacey James. <laughs> I'm like, all right, Lacey James, that works, right? Uh, but then sometimes it's just a matter of uh, uh, you start with the character named uh, one thing. And then as you progress in the story, you change that character's name. Right? That's Which happened with really children chicken. too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not, not with me. Right? But... <laughs> <laughs> they start out one with one name yeah. and then they change their really name. I know. The ball on this so one. <laughs> whew, then it's then it's an editorial nightmare to make sure that there are no instances of the original name. Mm. In one in one book, I changed the characters' names like three or four times right before I was finally happy with it. And so when a reader comes back and says, "Hey, I really love what you did with uh, Jamie's character," I'm like, "Jamie, I'm like, who the heck's Jamie?" <laughs> and then I'm thinking, "Oh, right, that was the character that was like this and this and this." Right, got it. Oh, the character thank you. I'm formerly so glad known that you as like Prince. <laughs> Well, speaking of characters, you know, readers do rave about the realistic characters you create. Can you talk a little bit about the process you use to develop those characters? Yeah, you know, um, when I wrote my first book, um, my mentor at work, uh, Ben Bauermeister, um, said, hey, you should meet my wife, right? She's a writer, too. And her name's Erica Bauermeister. And since she's become like a New York Times bestselling author. But, uh, you know, when she read my book, uh, she's like, wow, your plot is amazing. And so she's telling her husband one day that uh, if I could take like Chris's plotting skill and like marry it with this other person's like ability to write characters. And that made me think, oh, do I need to like write characters better? And so I spend a lot of time in the next couple books really working on the craft of 
of uh, developing deeper characters. And so, you know, one of the things I used to do a lot, like very um, consciously, but have to do less of it now. But um, when I was first starting out really going into deep character, I was thinking about if there's a particular characteristic uh, that I want this character to display, do I know somebody like that? Right. And so I would think about, is there somebody I know? And it's not like you would like base the character on that person, but that way that person exhibits that one characteristic, you know, you would try to nail what that looks like. And then I'd think about why does that person do the thing that they do? Right. And so when I was writing Dark Harvest, for example, I uh, wrote a character who's, you know, basically assisting uh, the bad guy in his bad deeds. And I was thinking about, you know, uh, one of the lines that she won't cross is integral to the book. And it's like, why won't she cross that line? And I thought, because she loves babies. And I thought, okay, so uh, my mom always loved babies. I mean, she loved my kids at every age, but there's something really was really special for her at the baby phase. And I thought, why is that? And I think it was because of unconditional love, right? A baby just loves you unconditionally, right? You look at that baby and there's trust. And so I thought, okay. And so then I thought, what would make this character kind of exhibit that, right? And so I came up with like an origin scene for her that kind of defined why that was so important to her and why that was like a defining thing. And so it's like finding that... Um, piece of a person that you know, and kind of walking back to in your mind, right? What are some of the experiences that they've had that forms that character? And, you know, it's funny, it's those things, I think, that resonate most with people. And, you know, sometimes there are characters that start out small, particularly in a series. And when they have a bigger role in the series, then I need to pause and spend a little bit of time thinking about, you know, what does Eli do when he's not, you know, solving crimes and, and like flashing a gun? What does he do? Right. And I think he's I think he's a really good cook. And, you know, he's got some uh, aging parent issues. Right. And so he's just a really good guy. And the reason why he left the big town to come to small town, right, are all of those family things that make him who he is. And so spending time thinking about your character when they're off page actually helps you deepen how they show up when they're on page. And I think that's one of the secrets to uh, a good series is revealing those things about the character slowly and building those characters and those relationships over time. Because you can't have like huge character arcs in a series. You start out with smaller character arcs, right? But the bigger arc kind of spans the length of the series so that you're always giving your readers something fresh. Over your years writing, what would you say has improved the most? Gosh, what hasn't improved, right? Sometimes uh, when I read uh, some of the early stuff I've written, it's like it's like sanding my eyeball <laughs> with sandpaper. Don't do that. It's like, oh, that does not sound man. smart. <laughs> Right. I tried that it, once, it actually kind only of makes, once. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of makes listening to audiobooks of your own work hard, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm always editing in my head going, oh, why did I use that word? Or there's like one too many words in that sentence. And blah, 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 blah. But um, I think that I've worked really hard to uh, develop uh, characters. I've also worked really hard to um, improve kind of... Uh, the narrative where uh, taking those moments where you do description or, you know, some little piece of internal dialogue and really polishing them to they shine. I once heard a poet talk to a group of uh, writers, uh, novelists, and they're like, you know, we work really hard on every word as poets, which is something that you obviously can't do if you've got a book that's 100,000 words because you'd never write, finish anything. But you can take like one thing in a chapter and make that one thing in a chapter really sing. And that elevates the quality of your writing. So the other thing I've learned, and my dad told me this in high school, but um, it, apparently I'm a slow learner. Uh, you have to read your work out loud. And, you know, I'm too lazy to do that. But now Word reads it back to me. And that is like the best editing tool ever. All right. This has been great. Well, now it's time for our special bonus round, a series of questions we like to call Hot Six. Buckle up, listeners. It's time for Hot Six. Question one, what is the most overrated book you've read? <laughs> uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. That is a popular answer. Yes. <laughs> I know. Or Twilight. It's, it's neck and neck, baby. <laughs> Question two, what famous literary work have you never read but feel like you should have? Slaughterhouse-Five. 
Number three. And The Great Gatsby. (laughs) (laughs) It's amazing that you would admit to not reading The Great Gatsby. (laughs) I know. My kids are like, what? You haven't read it? (laughs) I'm like, no. The audio But I do have it on audiobook, so it's coming up. (laughs) Um, If you could be any animal for one day, what would you be? Oh man, I want to be I want to be my dog Max, right? Cuz he sleeps half the day and yet he's got this ferocious bark. He's like all of 10 pounds and sounds like a pit bull and I want to be that. <laughs> the smallest dogs always have the you know, mine is is it's bigger than that but not big as dogs go and he he thinks he's a mighty wolf prowling the, you know, forest. Yeah. It's it's adorable. Well, and I named him Maximus. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> it's my own fault I did this. <laughs> Question four What is your biggest grammatical pet peeve? Oh, it's more spoken than it is on the page. But, you know, when I moved to Washington State, uh, you would say thank you to somebody and they go, uh huh. <laughs> and it's just like, Oof. <laughs> oh. My eye twitch, twitches every time that happens. I can see that. I'm never going there. Uh, I'm like, dude, (laughs) what your parents teach you? Come on. All right. Number five, looking back over your entire lifetime, what is your most embarrassing favorite song? That's hard. I used to own a, uh, I started a retail record store in my hometown back in the 90s. And so guilty pleasure songs, huh? Love Shack by the B-52s. Question six. What is one book that you wish you had written? Oh, man, there are so many of those. The Great Gatsby? Um, (laughs) (laughs) She would have known. War and Peace, you know? (laughs) Because nobody gets to do that. Um, uh, The Martian by Andy Weir. What a fabulous Hmm. book. That is amazing. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for being on Flock Talk. We really appreciate your time. This has been great. Thank you both very much. I really appreciate it. And so good to meet you both in person. Yay. You too. You've been listening to Flock Flock Talk, Talk. the podcast where we feature your favorite authors and narrators. Hosted by Craig Hart and Sarah Hannon. This podcast is produced by Pink Flamingo Productions. Productions. Editing by Craig Hart. Visit us today at pinkflamingoproductions.com. 